Welcome to the tutorial on the rhetorical triangle and rhetorical appeals. Having a good understanding of these concepts will provide you with invaluable tools for effectively analyzing different texts that you encounter and for writing good academic arguments. We find these concepts discussed in the writings of the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle, who taught, among a great many other things, about argumentation and persuasive oratory. First, it is critical to know what we mean when we use the term rhetoric. While there is no singular definition of the rhetoric, for the purposes of this tutorial, we'll use the most famous definition, which happens, which happens to come from Aristotle as well, which is the ability to see or identify in any given circumstance the available means of persuasion. So rhetoric is a kind of analysis that seeks to understand how people do things with words, images, and actions. It is not really a study of what people say and do as much as a study of how and why the things people say and do affect others. As this definition suggests, rhetoric is a very broad term. So to accomplish any sort of real analysis, we must impose some structure and guidelines that will shape the questions we ask. That is where the rhetorical triangle and rhetorical appeals come in. They help shape and separate rhetoric into identifiable and more manageable parts. So while these partitions are, to one degree or another, artificial, they are necessary to begin putting names and meanings to the field of rhetoric. First, the rhetorical triangle is made up of three parts, the author, the audience, and the text. Every persuasive situation contains these three aspects. The author is the person or persons who generates the text, the audience is the person or persons who receives the text, and naturally, the text is the message or messages transmitted between the author and the audience. The three rhetorical appeals also help describe the persuasive process, but they do so in a more specific way than the rhetorical triangle. According to Aristotle, these appeals represented the three main avenues by which people are persuaded. First is logos, which is a Greek word with a number of meanings, but we use the word reason. People are persuaded by logic, or we might say the facts. There are many different kinds of logic and factual evidence that can be used to persuade, but anything used to appeal to someone's rational side would fall under the realm of logos. Second is ethos, which is best translated as credibility or authority. An appeal to ethos is one that demonstrates the author's honesty, trustworthiness, and expertise. Anything an author does that makes an audience view him or her in a more positive light is an effective appeal to ethos. Finally, pathos is the flip side of logos. Roughly translated as emotion, pathos is an appeal to an audience's feelings of one sort or another, whether that's anger, sadness, joy, sympathy. Aristotle believed that among the three rhetorical appeals, logos was the most important because it was the strongest and most reliable, but the most effective persuasion happens when all three appeals are used. However, it is difficult to really understand these concepts in the abstract, so let's try to apply them to an actual text to see how they can immediately help us begin to analyze how that text is working. First, let's watch this Ford Mustang commercial, which we know is meant to be persuasive since it's an advertisement, and then we will put forward a few questions about it using the concepts of the rhetorical triangle and the rhetorical appeals for you to think about and possibly discuss with classmates. Five for a Mustang. The 
virgin who lives. Ford built for the road ahead. First, let's think about this commercial in terms of how it's appealing to pathos and how it's identifying an audience. Who do you think is the intended audience for this text? How do you know? How does this text try to rev up its audience's emotions? If you did not understand or find this text appealing, why do you think you weren't the audience for this commercial? For instance, to really understand everything that's going on in this commercial, you need to be familiar with two movies that are heavily referenced but never really explained in this text. The first movie is Field of Dreams, where a corn farmer in Iowa, played by Kevin Costner, plows up his corn to build a baseball field because a heavenly voice instructs him to do so. Once he does, long-dead ballplayers, including his father and shoeless Joe Jackson, magically appear from the corn to play baseball. The other movie is Bullet, starring Steve McQueen, the long-dead man who appears out of the corn in this commercial. In recent years, Bullet and McQueen have become famous for a high-speed chase scene in the movie in which McQueen drives a 1968 Mustang all around the hills of San Francisco. While this com commercial brilliantly combines the quintessential qualities of both of these movies into this one text, if you were unfamiliar with one or both of these references, this text would doubtlessly be confusing and less effective than it would be otherwise. Next, let's think about this commercial in terms of its specific textual qualities and logical appeals. What aspects or qualities make this text unique and effective? What are some adjectives you would use to describe this text? What do those descriptions add up to? Does this text appeal to reason and logic in any ways? Could the images and sounds of the car be interpreted as evidence? How so? Remember that all of these questions have a flip side. For instance, instead of asking what aspects make this text unique and effective, we could also ask what makes the text ineffective. Similarly, we could ask how this text doesn't appeal to reason and logic, which is just as good of a question as the opposite. Finally, in terms of the author and ethos, what do we know about the authors of this text, if anything? How do we know it? What don't we know? Also, how is credibility gained and or lost in this text? Thank you for watching this tutorial, and remember that these concepts can be used to analyze any text you encounter, and they are particularly good to use as a starting place for understanding difficult and unfamiliar texts.